Good afternoon and welcome to the July 27th meeting of the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission. I will call the meeting to order and ask please for the introductory recording. Before we begin the agenda, the Wichita Sedgwick County Metropolitan Area Planning Commission and the Wichita Sedgwick County Board of Zoning Appeals would like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to this public hearing. For those in attendance, copies of the agenda for today's meeting, the public hearing procedure, and planning department staff reports on all agenda items are available in the lobby. The Planning Commission's and the BZA's bylaws limit the applicant on a zoning, subdivision, or variance application and his or her representatives to a total of 10 minutes of speaking time at the start of the hearing on that item, plus up to two minutes at the conclusion of that hearing. All other persons wishing to speak on agenda items are limited to three minutes per person. However, if they feel that it is needed and justified, the chairman may extend these times by up to two minutes. All speakers are requested to state his or her name and address for the record when beginning to speak. When you are finished speaking, please share your name, address, and the case number on the sheet provided in the room. This will enable staff to notify you if there are any additional proceedings concerning that item. All speakers at the podium, please remove your face mask before speaking into the microphone. Please note that all written and visual materials you present to the Commission and the Board will be retained by the Secretary as part of the official record. If you are not speaking, but you wish to be notified about future proceedings on a particular case, please provide your contact information to the Planning Department. The Planning Commission and the Board are interested in hearing the views of all persons who wish to express themselves on all the agenda items. However, we ask that all speakers please be as courteous and concise as possible and avoid long repetitions of facts or opinions which have already been stated. For your information, the Wichita City Council has adopted a policy for all city zoning items. A copy of this policy is available from the planning staff. The City Council relies on a written record of the Planning Commission hearings and does not conduct its own additional public hearings on these items. The decision of the BZA is final. Any appeal of a decision of the BZA is to the District Court. Thank you. Now I'd ask for a roll call of commissioners present, please. Certainly. Fox here. Duel. Bob Duel is absent. McKay here. Green here. Bill Johnson here. Blick. Josh Blick. Josh Blick is absent. Nix here. Foster here. Warren here. Joe Johnson. Here. Miles. Here. Hartman. Here. Aldrich. Here. Williams Bay. Here. Show 12 members present and two absent. Thank you. We, you have received minutes of three previous meetings prior to today. Um, so I would take, uh, entertain First of all, a uh, motion for the June 8th meeting minutes. I showed Duels, Nix, Hartman, and Aldrich as absent on that date. Second. Motion from Commissioner Johnson, Joe Johnson, for approval. A second from Commissioner Green. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Motion passes. I'll be abstaining. Uh, Four uh, and those abstaining, as I named Aldrich Hartman, Nix, and Duell. Four abstaining. Motion uh, three. Passes. There's three abstentions because Mr. Duell is absent. Ah, okay. Three. So 12 minus three. Yep. Nine, nine zero, three. zero, three. Thank you. 
Uh, then we'll move to the June 22nd meeting minutes. I show McKay, Blick, and Nix as abstent and abstaining. Um, I would entertain a motion. Move to approve. Motion from Commissioner Ward. Second. Second. Second, I heard Miles first. Second from Commissioner Miles. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. And that would again be nine zero no ten zero three. Thank you. This math is hard. Um. Thank you. Motion passes. The third uh, set of minutes is for July 13th, 2023. And I show Green, Blick, Nix, and Hartman as absent. Move for Move approval. Approve. Second. I heard a motion from Commissioner Joe Johnson and second from Cindy Miles. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. 10, zero, four, well, no, we have four abstaining. I, I believe it's nine, zero, three. Nine, zero, three. Ah, because one of our abstentions is not present today. Thank you. We got it. We are warmed up crowd now. Um, the next thing we will do is go through our agenda items for today and determine which we need to hear, which cases we need to hear. Um, so the first item on agenda is vacation item 2023 0025 located at 333 South Ridge Road. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Seeing none, does anyone in chambers want to hear this case? Seeing none, does anyone participating virtually want to hear this case? Vacation item 2023 0025. Hearing none, we'll take that item on consent. Item 3.2, vacation item 2023 0026. We're going to hear this item because of additional information since the subdivision committee considered it. Um, is the applicant or agent for this case present? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Move we approve item 3.1. I have a motion to approve com from Commissioner Green. Second. Second from Commissioner Hartman. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes 12-0. Moving on to the public hearing items. Uh, conditional use 2023 0031 located at 5847 North 231st Street West. We will hear this case due to an additional uh, request being placed. Um, is the applicant or agent for this case present? Yes, okay, thank you. Um, item 4.2, conditional use 2023, 0032, located uh, north of 101st Street North and east of North 47th Street East. Does anyone on the commission want to hear item 4.2? Seeing none, does anyone in chambers want to hear item 4.2? Seeing none, does anyone participating virtually want to hear item 4.2? Hearing none, we'll take that on consent. Item 4.3, zoning case 2023 0040, located at 5515 West MacArthur Road. Is there anyone on the commission who would like to hear this case? Seeing none, anyone in the chambers who would like to hear this case? Yes. Uh, Hoover and MacArthur, yes, okay. We will hear item 4.3 and item 4.4, which is um, DER 2023 quadruple zero four, we will hear this case and can I have a show of hands of how many are here to speak on this case? Okay, got a couple. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that takes, uh, could I have a motion? Maybe we approve item 4.2. Second. Motion from Commissioner Green, com second from Commissioner Foster. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 
Any opposed nay? Hearing none, motion passes 12-0. That takes us back to item 3.2. Uh, Philip, I believe is Madam Chair. Do we want to address the BZA? Yes, thank you. Um, we did have one case that was scheduled for the Board of Zoning Appeals today. That case had some requested materials that are not available and will be deferred indefinitely. For that reason, we're going to defer the approval of minutes that were slated for today as well, so we can handle both of those items at a future date to be announced. Thank you. And now Philip will present case 3.2. Good afternoon, Planning Commission. This is Philip Ziebenbergen with the planning staff. Um, 3.2 is coming before you with additional information um, that was given to planning staff after the subdivision committee considered this last week. Um, it's not anything or shattering a change in request. Um, an overview of the case, just briefly, not to get into the details, is the request is to vacate a portion of the South Dowell Terrace street right of way, as well as a 40 foot, a portion of a 40 foot platted building setback, a property located at 1045 South Dowell Terrace. The purpose of the request is the individual at 1045 South Dowell Terrace is looking to do a garage addition. Um, Paul, if you want to go to the aerial, please. And as you'll see, South Dow Terrace is an unimproved road. It is actually the source of two driveways that provide access to 1045 South Dow Terrace and the property to the east. This property owner would like to extend their garage out over and the, the size of the garage would actually extend over their property line, their current property line, which is yellow. If the vacation is approved, South Dow Terrace will be divided in half a portion down here will go to the HOA, a budding reserve. The eastern half will go to this property owner, and then a portion of the western half will go to this property owner here, effectively extending his property line, which is why he wants to vacate the building setback to create this area in the box as buildable area in order for the garage addition. This subdivision committee reviewed this in addition to um, other information um, provided at the hearing last week. Uh, the action of the subdivision committee was to grant the, or to recommend approval of the vacations. Um, the conditions were that this whole area here that was the street right of way be retained as a utility and access easement there are a number of utilities within there. You can see the sewer line, there's Evergy lines, there's a gas line. Um, and the reason it was also um, retained as an access easement is there's a dam back here with the retention pond in reserve A that is actually part of a larger portion of the overall stormwater management system for the watershed in the area as water flows out of there into the creek down here. And the dam needs to have access in order to be maintained. Um, in the past, there was information provided that when vehicles have come to provide maintenance to the dam, they used this area of right of way to get to that access point because any access along this property or this property, you have a very wooded area. It's not really easily accessible from any other position than the right of way here. And so it was. The, the applicant was amenable to it of retaining that. The question that arises based on how far over his property line, the subdivision committee granted four feet of this area here to not be part of that easement to allow it to be buildable area to accommodate the size of his garage. The new information you have today and it's in your on your table in front of you, I know the site plan's a little small to read, but I'll explain what it's showing. After the meeting, the applicant went to the surveyor he's been working with, and in discussion with him, it came about that his garage is going to extend over that line at its furthest point, 5.5 uh, feet and not 4 feet. That was not details to the applicant's memory to recall during the meeting, um, and so in order to ensure 
the request is granted without having to come back and go through this whole process again, we're able to talk about to today and possibly get an alternate recommendation from this board um, over the subdivision committee. So let's talk about the access easement. The subdivision committee effectively allowed a 56 foot access easement um, because four feet of it would not be allowed. It's a 60 foot right away. Five and a half feet reduces that to 54 and a half feet. So it really should have no change on the ability for vehicles to come down the easement in order to access the dam. And so we're bringing it before you as a request to grant the new information and actually retain the easement minus five and a half feet on the west abutting the applicant's property. So I hope I've made that clear. Um, there has been no public comment. Re well, I would say the public comment we received was from a neighbor to the west, and his comments was what caused the subdivision committee to consider retaining the access easement over the majority of the right of way in order to access the dam. Other than that, he's not opposed to the vacation. He just wanted to make sure access was there. I spoke with him yesterday and he's still okay with everything going forward. So we haven't had any opposition to this case. Um, no one spoke in opposition at subdivision committee. Again, we have the applicant here if you have any specific questions for him. Um, otherwise I can stand for questions you have for me. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Commissioner Johnson. Does the access easement take you all the way to the dam? What it does is it takes you down. It includes the bulb that was platted as a partial cul-de-sac. That's included in the access easement. And then that butts up against Reserve A that is owned by the HOA, which would allow for access to, because that's how they do it now. There's no access easement on the HOA property, but Reserve A is meant for utilities and the dam and maintenance purposes. So likely and it's the everything in the HOA everything in reserve A is to be maintained by the HOA so they would allow for vehicles to drive across property to maintain the dam commissioner aldrich instead of the you know the four foot that the subdivision did uh, and you're saying five and a half foot would it hurt anything or cause any issues uh, to grant six foot I don't think so. I think it'd be wise to grant a little shy space. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for staff? Okay, we're smiling. This was a great example of uh, the public comments helping lead us to a great solution. Uh, Commissioner Foster did a great job in coming up with a way to kind of split the difference and we just weren't quite generous enough. So um, applicant or agent, would you like to speak on this matter in addition to yeah. what staff has reported? Uh, he doesn't indicate he has okay. anything to add. Alrighty. Um, is there anyone in chambers who wanted to speak on this item in addition? Anyone participating virtually who would like to speak on this item? Hearing none, I'll bring it back to the commission. What's your pleasure? Uh, make a motion that we grant six foot. Okay, Commissioner Aldrich has so made a second. motion to uh, grant the request for an additional six feet. And Commissioner Williams Bay second in the motion. Any further discussion on this item? Hearing none, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 12 0. Thank you very much. Next item would be case 4.1, conditional use 2023 0031, and Mamita will be presenting for staff today. Hello, everyone. This is Mamita Kundu from Planning, and I would be presenting uh, CON 2023 31. The applicant is requesting a conditional use to allow an accessory apartment on the property zoned rural residential. The 36.95 acres of site is located at 5847 North, 231st Street West. The property is currently developed with a single family dwelling. Can we move to the next aerial map? And it also has a detached shade. If you can move to the site plan. Yeah. 
The applicant intends to construct an additional dwelling unit north of the existing dwelling unit and convert the existing dwelling unit into an accessory apartment. The on-site sewer is provided by a wastewater lagoon that is located southwest of the existing dwelling unit. Water is provided by a well, uh, a private well water source. The applicant has a new request which is not included in the staff report. Uh, they are requesting to have a separate water well for the accessory apartment. The case was presented at the Citizen Advisory Board 3 on 24th of July, 2023, and has been approved with this new request. If you move to the zoning map. Mm -hmm, thank you. The character of the area is rural and low density residential. The properties to the north, south, east, and west are all zoned rural residential. Properties north, east, and west of the subject site are in use as agricultural land or are developed with single family dwellings. Properties to the south is in use as agricultural land. The property is unplatted. Section three of the subdivision regulations state that any expansion of residential uses is exempt from the platting process. There are no zoning cases on the site. If you move to the urban growth area map. The request is in conformance with the community investment plan, which identifies the site as being in the rural growth area on the 2035 urban growth areas map. The staff is recommending approval with the conditions that accessory apartment shall remain accessory to and under the same ownership as the principal single family residence and the ownership shall not be divided or sold as a condominium. The exterior materials are to be complementary to the main structure. The sewer services shall be the same as the main structure and provided in compliance with the Sedgwick County Sanitation Code before a building permit will be issued. Water, electric, gas, telephone, and cable television, tel television utility services may be provided as separate utility services. The applicant shall obtain all applicable permits, including but not limited to building, health, and zoning. The development and maintenance of the site shall be in conformance with the approved site plan. And if the zoning administrator find that there is a violation of any of the conditions of the conditional use, the zoning administrator may with the concurrence of the planning director de declare that the conditional use is null and void. The staff received no public comment on this case. And uh, let's go through the site photos one by one. This is looking north towards the site. Next. Looking north towards the location of the principal structure that has been proposed to build. Next. Looking west towards the site. Next. Looking south towards the site. Next. Looking towards the accessory apartment from the west. So right now this is the main dwelling, but it would be converted to an accessory apartment once the other unit has been built. Next. Okay, looking northwest towards the site. I think this is the last picture that we have. Next, is there any, okay, yeah. Looking northeast from the site. And with that, I will stand for any questions. Any questions for staff? Does the, uh, Commissioner Warren, go ahead. The first condition uh, says that the property would remain under the same ownership. Uh, if somebody wanted to, divide this off in a separate deal later? Could, could they do that by going through a planning process or mm -hmm. is, this, is this not something that, that can never be divided with what we're doing today? Uh, they can do it through a planning process and I will let Scott comment on that. Yeah, that's correct. They can do that through the planning process. They can do lot split or platted as multiple properties. Um, and in that case, then I would know in terms of the accessory use, uh, 
then it would, you would have two separate properties. And if they're the right size, then they could each have a dwelling unit on them. Thank you. Any other questions for staff at this time? Um, thank you, Momita. Would the applicant or agent uh, like to speak, please? Come to the podium and state your name and address and tell us about your project. Hi, everyone. My name is Jake Martin. Uh, our address is 5847 North 231st Street West, Andale 67001. My wife and I are here. Um, why are we here? We are here. This is our family's primary residence that you guys saw the pictures of here. It, as you look through some of the details, the original permit for the, for the house was pulled in 1885. Obviously, it's extremely dated, but it is an old family house. There's some sentimental attachment there, right? And so our intention is to leave the house stand so we can construct a new home uh, adjacent or on the same property. Um, to do that, we'd like to tie into the existing septic system that is there now. The one change that we requested uh, was to uh, go ahead and put in a new water well to uh, supply the new home. Uh, the only reason for that change is the house was built in 1885. Obviously, the well is not that old, but it is old. We kind of felt like dollars spent on trying to tie into that existing infrastructure uh, may not be worthwhile. We wanted to be able to go ahead and put a new well attached to the new house. So that was all. Uh, any, any questions for me? Any questions? Okay, there being nothing that I see from the commission. Thank you. Okay. Stay close. Thank you. Um, is there anyone in chambers who would like to speak on this item? Anyone participating virtually who would like to speak on this item? Uh, I would then bring this back to the commission. Commissioner Chairman, Foster. I move to approve well, with the change. Question? I have a question for County Public Works, perhaps. I don't know. The, the additional well for water, is that in any way an issue with, with the county? That would actually be a, a question for MABCD, and I do not see a representative from MABCD here. Uh, uh, Director, yeah, wait if I could. Um, so planning staff Omita met today with Kelly Dixon from MABCD to talk through this uh, process. And so there is a process that they would have to go through in terms of getting a new well. It's the same process anyone has to go through out in the unincorporated county if they want to do a well. Um, but it certainly seems feasible, and Kelly didn't seem to have any any uh, heartburn over the issue. So, thank you, Commissioner Nix. Question? I don't have a question, but I have a comment. I just think that uh, being able to maintain or restore, maybe not restore is the right word, but an old house that's that that has that kind of history is a great idea. The longer it can stand, the more I'm in favor of it. That was our intention as well. <laughs> All right, great. Any other comments or questions? Then I had a motion to approve this. from Commissioner Bill Johnson and a second from Commissioner Green. Any responsible assistant county counselor. Just for clarification on the record, in terms of the war, the uh, the motion was to uh, approve, but with the proposed changes in yes. regards to the war, correct? So that would indicate both a uh, a partial waiver of the supplemental use regulation 3D6A4 in regards to the wire service. And that would also mean a change to number two of the uh, proposed conditions in regards to the wire services as well. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. That's what Commissioner Bill Johnson intended. And we'll be, are you amenable to those adjustments in your second, Commissioner Green? Yeah, because that's what he meant. Okay. Very good. Any further discussion on this item? Thank you very much. I look forward to watching the activity in my neighborhood. All in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes 12-0. Thank you so much for your testimony. Brings us to item 4.3, zoning case 2023-00040, and Christina will uh, present the staff comments. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Christina Reith, Associate Planner with the Planning Department. This is case number zone 2023-0040. The applicant is requesting a zone change from SF5 single family residential to TF3 two family residential. The property is 18 and a half acres in size and is located at 5515 West MacArthur Road. The subject site is currently undeveloped. The applicant has indicated they're, they're requesting the zone change for this duplex development. It is unknown how many duplexes will be developed on site. Should the zone change request be approved, there will be no change in setbacks, parking requirements, or maximum height. Uh, the only difference is that single family residence requires a 5,000 square foot minimum lot size, while TF3, two family residential, requires a 3,000 uh, square foot minimum lot size per dwelling unit, or in this case, for duplex development, it would be 6,000 square feet. Um, on May 11th, 2023, the subject site was annexed into the city of Wichita, and there are no zoning cases associated with this property. The requested zone change is in conformance with the Community Investments Plan. When you take a look at the 2035 Future Growth Concept Map, it identifies the site as appropriate for residential and employment mixed uses. The plan defines residential and employment mix as areas of land that will be developed or redeveloped by 2035 with uses predominantly of a mixed nature. Due to the proximity of higher intensity businesses, residential housing types within this area will likely be higher density. Duplex development is thus an appropriate use of land, uh, for this area. Based upon the information available at the time that staff report was prepared, staff recommends that the zone change request be approved. The recommendation is based on the golden rules that we all follow, which are listed in your staff report. I will go and skip ahead to the last one, which is opposition or support of neighborhood residents. And at the time the staff report was prepared, staff received one comment in regards to the requested zone change, and that's attached in your staff report. Let's go to the site photos, please. This is looking east towards the site. Next slide, please. This is looking south towards the site. Next slide, please. This is looking north away from the site. Next slide, please. And this is looking west away from the site. And with that, I will stand for questions. Questions for staff at this time? Seeing none, we'll ask the applicant or, agent, applicant or agent please to step forward and tell us about your project. We'll need your name and address and you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tim Chad, um, address 2326 North Lakeway Circle in Wichita, Kansas, 67205. Uh, along with myself and my brother, David, um, we're proposing to develop 18.49 acres in the MacArthur, south uh, east of MacArthur and Hoover Road for a multi-family community. It's really pretty simple. Our goal is just to provide quality, affordable housing for that area. Uh, we still think inventory is very low. Um, just want to build a very nice product and uh, offer folks in that area either to purchase uh, a, a duplex, lease a duplex, or purchase one side of a duplex. It's really, that's really what we want to accomplish. Okay, any questions for the applicant? Commissioner Warren? Yes, sir. Do you have any uh, thoughts to the letter that we've got concerning traffic? And um, You know, right there's two lanes in all directions. Um, I, obviously the infill, the way engineering is going, where it looks like 60 to 70 units, uh, we're gonna save that, uh, Northwest corner for possible commercial down the road. Um, I, I wish I could give you an answer that I knew what was going to happen with the roads, but I, I just don't have that information. It's not, I, I, I'm not pertinent to that information. I'm sure there's studies done by the city and the county on traffic on what needs to be done as far as improvement on roads, widenings, but uh, sir, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stay tuned, you'll have a chance to come back. Uh, now I'll call for any public comment on this item. If you wanna make public comment, please proceed to the podium. 
give your name and address and you have three minutes to speak. <laughs> Hello. So I'm Allison Seiler, and uh, I'm at 3818 South Flora. Um, so I'm right across the street, across MacArthur from where the, the twin homes will go or the duplexes. So I'm nervous. I'm sorry, I'm nervous. What's a day at work for you? It's a bit <laughs> emotional for my neighbors and I. So, so help um, just understand my nervousness. So just a quick timeline. I thought we had 10 minutes, not three. So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, condense, but 15 years ago, we moved in, we found out, you know, behind our home, the county owns a place where you guys dump rocks and stuff. It's dusty and it's loud, but we didn't complain because that's on us. We didn't research it before we moved in, right? So live with what you didn't research. And then um, eight to 10 years ago, we paved our road. Um, it was a vote of our neighborhood and uh, we voted against it because we didn't have the money at the time and didn't want to pay for it, but our neighbors voted for it, a little bit of a questionable vote, but it got passed, so that's okay, we have to pay it, we're still paying on that road, and, and it went through legally, we're, we're good with that, um, we're a little, it upsets me a little bit because we see all kinds of roads being paved now that the city or the county are paying for, while I'm still 10 years later paying for my road. So, um, but again, that's just another time, you know, dealing with um, the city or the county. Then four to five years ago, we had twin homes put in across the street from where they are proposing to develop. And we were okay with that, right? Because you do need affordable housing for places. So we understood that. Did it help the value of our home? Probably not, but we were okay with that. Then about one to two years ago, they put in a Dollar General and we fought that. We don't want a Dollar General. We've got the twin homes. We don't want a Dollar General. We were overruled. We weren't heard. And the Dollar General went in regardless. And I believe that was through the city, but it's still, it was another uh, time we got to talk to government and, and, and didn't get listened to. So now we're talking about adding more twin homes. So understand from my point of view, I'm good with the first set of twin homes we had. I'm good sharing the community, you know, it's okay, but, but enough is enough. I mean, you can do a simple Google research and see that rental homes lower your value almost 14%. You can go to realtor.com and find that out. So we've already had one set, one division of twin homes put in. Let's build the twin home somewhere else. We've had ours added. And I would just say that um, as I've spoken to all of my neighbors about this. And I've spoken to a lot of neighbors and I've said, you know, what do you think about these twin homes? And nobody wants them. I mean, I see the room isn't very full here today, but nobody wants them. And I was like, well, why don't you come to the meeting and let's just share that we don't want another set of twin homes. We're happy with what we got. We're happy to share our neighborhood with the new people, but we don't want any more. We want single family residential. That's what we're looking for. And your, your time is up. Is there one more, any, yeah. any other concept that you could quickly Yeah, I just want to share? say that their response was, well, it won't matter if you go anyway. And if that doesn't at least make worry you guys a little bit, it should make you a little sad. The constituents feel that way. And I would ask that you listen to what we're saying. And instead of ruling us, why don't you represent us? We don't want another twin home division. So we're asking you to please represent us in this. That's it. Thank you. Can you use the mouse to show us where your home is re relative yeah. to this? You said on the other side of MacArthur. Over, I'm down here. Okay, so it's kind of north of Dollar General, but on the north side. Right. Okay. Exactly. Um, Commissioner Johnson, can you show us with the cursor where the other uh, twin twin home development? Right over is? here. These are all twin home. Uh, I think and, it goes clear down to over here. And what's across the street? Just single family. Yeah, all of this is single family. I mean, to them. Oh, here? The yeah, east. everything is single family except right through here. Yeah, in the red is twin homes. This will be twin homes. Everything else is single back, single residential, single family residential. The developer indicated that they will be looking to sell as well as rent. And as price points of homes have gone up, 
duplex is more of the entry point. The fact that they will look for owner occupants as well as renters, does that have any impact on your views? It doesn't. It doesn't. You know that some of them are going to be bought for renters. Are are you, can I ask him a question or are, are you going to own these or are you selling? To you somebody can't else? ask him a question directly, but you can. Oh, I'm sorry. But, um, he can respond to your right. concern in a rebuttal. Right. So uh, the question is, are they the single owners at this time or are there investors? Okay. Um, any other questions for the speaker? Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else who would like to? speak on this item anybody else who wants to speak on this item to the group okay is there anyone participating virtually who would like to speak on this item hearing none applicant or agent if you'd return uh, you have two minutes to respond to what you've heard uh, the response to the question is my brother and myself will develop and build these out and real simple with interest rates on the rise, entry level folks that need to wanna to purchase a home, it's much easier for them to get into one side, 1200 square feet, three bedroom, two bath, two car garage. We're gonna look at all avenues, but our goal is to keep these properties or sell them. I, there's no other investors. It's myself and my brother. Uh, Commissioner Aldrich. Yes, sir, I'm just curious on the North, east part of the property there's like a wedge sliver uh what is that is that access to the the big ditch uh, there that is the big ditch the valley center floodway on the east side of the property there is no access from this said property that we're developing to the big ditch is that what did that answer your question well, no uh, right there on the northeast corner of the the blue uh -huh. the triangle uh, there's like a, yeah there's like a little wedge right there i'm just curious what that is uh commissioner or director wadel you have a comment sure um it appears from the map that that's actually right of way or at least not not private property because private property is outlined in yellow on there and you can see where that wedge kind of drives kind of south and east along the property that there doesn't appear to be a yellow line to the north I thought he I thought he stated he was gonna retain something for commercial. I'll let him address that if you'd like. Well the my Christina, the proposed is in the blue, correct? And the in the uh, northwest corner is yeah. So so you own the northwest corner that's not in blue? and yes yes that you're retaining for potential future commercial correct okay and that's what it's already zoned i believe and i believe you're yeah. right about that being easement right away and also one other note i don't know if it's pertinent or not but there's an at&t vault on the northern part of that and they have right away there serve communication to cesta or textron okay uh commissioner foster has a question is there enough link between the the area you're planning to develop for duplexes outlined in blue and the right of way of macarthur to allow for access onto Arth macarthur it the, looks like the, a very narrow way proposed there. engineering is access on macarthur and on hoover road as well and to, to access and entry and exit points all right thank you okay any additional questions did, and we called for virtual. Okay, thank you very much. That brings us back to the commission. Um, you want to start with some discussion? Any thoughts, Commissioner Foster? Simply, we do listen to the public when they come to these meetings, but understand we have heard the same argument many, many times before. And we also, while we try to represent members of the public who come here, we also represent or are supposed to represent the public in general, including people who want entry level housing in this community and can't afford it at the moment. So we have reasons for wanting to approve development of duplexes. Also, just for my personal perspective, I live in a neighborhood with single family homes and apartments and duplexes and commercial all on the same block. 
and it's not as awful as people seem to think it is there i think some of your fears may be unfounded any other comments or questions discussion Madam Chair, i move that we approve um this case is presented second, second. motion from commissioner green a second from commissioner mckay uh any further discussion all in favor please indicate by saying aye aye, aye. Any opposed, nay? Motion passes 12 0. And thank you for your testimony. That brings us to item 4.4. And uh, Director Wadel will present this, this case for us today. All right, we're gonna give folks a chance to get the PowerPoint loaded on this one. So it might take just a little bit, um, but I can do the introduction again, Scott Wadel from the planning department. The item before you is consideration of an amendment to the unified zoning code. Uh, this amendment would specifically uh, make changes to the old town overlay district. And here's the PowerPoint. So I'll take you through uh, using this. All right, next slide. There we go. So uh, the recommendation is that you initiate an amendment to the Unified Zoning Code. And second part of that is that you approve the proposed uh, changes or updates to the code. Next slide, please. So in terms of existing conditions, uh, so there is an overlay district. As you know, there's uh, zoning that we've talked about in cases before this. Uh, in this instance, there is an overlay uh, layer of zoning in addition to the typical zoning that you see for properties. And this is not for Delano, but this is for Old Town. Uh, and so uh, this is in Old Town. It specifically prohibits uh, tattooing and body piercing uh, with as a land use in underneath that overlay district. Well, uh, we there is a tattoo business that opened. If you're familiar with the former first gear, uh, location in Old Town. That's where uh, that uh, store, or that business opened. Uh, we received a complaint about it. Uh, we went out and evaluated it, confirmed that it was a violation of the zoning code, and provided notice to them. As part of this process, a community dialogue started up about um, whether or not the business should be allowed to remain. Uh, we received feedback from the Old Town Association that their preference was to allow that business to remain and to look at options for how that could be done. Um, we have been in dialogue uh, for quite a while about uh, what the preferred option is. And uh, after some conversation also with MAPC Advanced Plans and then back to the Old Town Association, the preferred option now is to update the overlay uh, district for Old Town in order to allow tattooing and body piercing as land use there. So this slide shows you the map of the Old Town overlay district. You can see that it uh, is one large area, but then also there's a number of areas that um, have been included in it, including one of them being the anchor, um, as well as uh, a business further uh, to the business further uh, south of Douglas. Next slide, please. So uh, in the zoning code, I know you can't read this, but what I've highlighted is that the uh, specific text from the Old Town Overlay District that uh, uh, does not allow for tattooing and body piercing. Next slide, please. So uh, in terms of events, I've explained kind of where we've been so far. This is just a slide to show you kind of the sequence of events about how we got here. Next slide. So um, as part of that dialogue with the Old Town uh, Association, they also commented that uh, they were fine with having uh, tattooing and body piercing, but there were some conditions that they would like to see uh, attached to that so that any, any of those operations operating in Old Town would have to comply with. And the, they are these two. Number one, that they would be operated by appointment only. And number two, that they would operate between the hours of 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. So they could not open earlier, could not be open later than that. So that has been included in the recommendation to you. Next slide. In terms of process, uh, so 
Uh, the public notice uh, did go out, so it was distributed to every property within the Old Town Overlay District, as well as properties within 1,000 feet. So the notification area is quite large for this case. Uh, we are holding the MAPC public hearing uh, today. If you uh, vote to uh, approve it, then it will go forward to the city council and then later to the county commission, uh, because again, it's a joint zoning code. So it would go to both. Next slide, please. So again, the recommendation is that you initiate the amendment and number two is that you approve the proposed uh, zoning code changes. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Commissioner Johnson. Scott, under what approval process that, that, is it there right now? Uh, it is, the tattoo business is currently in violation of the zoning code. Uh, we have suspended the enforcement actions as uh, we are looking at a solution to get them into compliance. And this, this is the preferred solution at this time. Well, but did they get a building permit? Uh, no, sir, the building was already, uh, already there. My understanding is that they have simply leased the space. Thank so, you, Commissioner Nix, you had a question? So if I decide to get a tattoo, Scott, uh, probably not gonna happen, but if I decide to do it and I go up and knock on the door, Turn me away and tell me to call me for an appointment. Is that what it is? Uh, that, uh, in a manner of speaking, yes. So they would have to operate by appointment only. Yes. Commissioner Warren. Scott, I was when this was presented to advanced plans, there was a theory behind that, that appointment. Do you want to elaborate on that? Um, if you'd like, sir, and then I can follow up. I'll take two places of business sometimes have lines that, that are, becomes a place to work. And so if they were doing it by appointment, we'll around the, the around the business. So that was the concern the other businesses had. And that's why if it was on an appointment basis, it would make that or reduce it. If you have lines, probably somebody's going to open up next door. If they have you to used to work in a restaurant business anyway. Um, but if you can do it by an appointment basis, they're they're not gonna they're not gonna hang around the outside waiting to, to go in. They'll go in with their appointment. Commissioner, I just don't see how you're going to enforce a bit. Commissioner Foster, you had a question. Well, partly on that issue, um, what's to stop people from saying, "Well, I want an appointment for two minutes from now." Um, I understand now what the logic is behind it, but I think it maybe needs to be a little more specific appointments made at least a day ahead or something like that. And, and also, also mentioned, is there some sort of a limit on the number of tattoo parlors that might be um, ensconced in Old Town at some point? Sure. Can there be? Uh, with both uh, addressing both of those questions or statements. So um, in terms of the second one, would there be a limit? Uh, in fact, there would not be. So there's no distance separation. There's no cap on the number of tattoo or body piercing businesses that can be in operation if, if this change is approved. Uh, the first one in terms of uh, setting up the appointments, uh, yes. And as Commissioner Warren has indicated, the I think the concern or the uh, the statement that kind of came forward was uh, preventing uh, folks from being outside in line for a tattoo and then having the bar activity and it being later in the night and then uh, disturbances or something perhaps occurring. Now, could a business, as you indicated, operate by saying, hey, uh, Mr. Nix, Commissioner Nix has knocked on the door. He wants a tattoo. Well, we can fit you in uh, in five minutes. Why don't you wait in our lobby? Uh, you know, would that constitute an appointment? I believe that it would, but yeah. We have a commissioner, Bill Johnson has a question. I think the other thing that's good about that is it is down an area where people are drinking. They might get brave and want a tattoo or be put up to it because of a group they're with or whatever. If they make an appointment, they might sober up by the time they get a point. <laughs> and they may not want one. Commissioner Aldrich. How long has this business been in operation? You know, I'm going to look to JR to help me out with this one, but I believe that uh, we received the complaint in late 2022. Is that correct, JR? I'm thinking so. 
September, but I wouldn't stake my life on it. Late, late summer, early fall, I would say. Okay, so they've been operating almost a year uh, and they're not in compliance. And now all of a sudden they're going to get rewarded and be allowed to do their business. Well, I guess to that comment, I would just add that uh, it has taken a number of months to determine what the options are in order to um, address the the, uh, the what we've received as a percent as the uh, conversation about allowing them to remain. There's a number of different options to accomplish that, and then to arrive at this being the preferred one. They should have been shut down until they everything else got straightened away. I mean, it's again they're operating. They're not in compliance. They were allowed to operate. And now you're in a situation where, you know, you're going to make a change uh, to the regulations just so they can operate their business that they shouldn't have been doing in the first place. Commissioner Foster. I'm old and uh, my attitudes toward tattoos are different uh, from what they are now. But I think that's part of the issue here is that Tattoo parlors are zoned the way they are often zoned because the assumption was that it would be a bunch of undesirables and drunken sailors going to get tattoos. Well, if you've gone through any you know, college campus lately or a restaurant that's got young servers, it's everybody these days. And I personally don't want people sticking needles in my skin that way, but a lot of people apparently do. So I think the fact that we're updating zoning regulations to reflect the reality of how people feel about tattoo and piercing now is appropriate. We ought to be updating it and recognizing our new reality. Um, I do, I would like there to be some sort of distance limit um, to make sure that we don't end up with a tattoo parlor row in Old Town and uh, and the appointment issue still bothers me. I can see them making appointments through some phone app where you have the 50 people in a row waiting outside in line, all straight out of the bars, making appointments at 10 minute intervals. Um, I think that needs to be more specific before I would be happy for voting for approval for this. I have uh, Commissioner Green with a question. Yeah, I, I know that. Mr. Johnson asked a question about permitting and all of this. Isn't there some kind of a licensing procedure that is involved with tattoo parlors? Um, and, and at that time, is that when it was determined that this was not in an area that, that it could be? Or it just it, licensing has nothing to do with getting a permit to open up a business or? Well, you've, you've asked a number of questions there. Yeah, I know, I know. I mean, I'm trying to get around to, is um, it, 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 it's obviously is a licensed business or it is not a licensed business. And did the zoning piece of that determine whether it was a licensed business for tattooing or not? I'll attempt to address those. As I think I understand them, the city does not license them. I believe the state regulates tattoo parlors, tattoo shops, tattoo businesses. As for how it came to our attention, it was not through a local licensing, it was through a complaint. That's how it came to our attention. That's how we knew. And I have this big recollection that the business had been advised when they signed the lease that it was okay to have a tattoo parlor there. So part of it was poor information or is that irrelevant? at this time in dis in discussions from our perspective in discussions and communications with the business um, after providing them notice and, and saying hey you are operating in violation uh, they had indicated that they were unaware okay. commissioner aldrich yeah my comment earlier had nothing to do with whether i approve or disapprove tattoos that's up to an individual choice and if they want to mark themselves up or put a bunch of holes in themselves, they they can do that. They have their their that freedom to do that. My concern was any business that's operating uh, out of compliance, you know, whether it's a you know any you know any business as far as that goes. And then if they get caught where they're not supposed to be operating and all of a sudden you start changing 
you know, the rules around where, hey, you know, it's okay, you know, to uh, not abide by our ordinances or our statutes uh, or the zoning codes. We'll just fix the zoning codes to allow you to continue doing what you're doing. That's that's what 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 bothers me a little bit about it. I can care less whether somebody wants to get tattoos or not. Uh, Commissioner Bill Johnson. Uh, Scott, remind me how many years ago it's been. A lot of this property was industrial zoning, and it was down zone because of the land. You know, I, I can't speak to the whole history of it, but in uh, a quick review of the files, it appears that the overlay district uh, largely came into place as it is today, somewhere around the early 90s. So it appears 91, 92, somewhere in that time frame. So prior to that, there were a lot of industrial buildings. And it is my understanding that there was, yeah, warehousing and industrial activities that were taking place prior to that. Secondly, I can remember... I can't tell you when, but when we first heard about licensing or doing whatever with tattoo parlors, I wasn't, I w it wasn't against it, wasn't for it, didn't make no difference because they're the same way. I'm not going to get poked with a needle unless I have to. Uh, but I'll be truthfully, when we went through that whole ordeal over tattoo parlors and piercing, I didn't think they would survive. So that shows you what I know. All right. Uh, uh... Mr. Cox, you had a comment that you wanted. Okay, all righty. Uh, we do, I believe, have some. Commissioner Warren. I just want to add to the discussion that I think one of the main factors here is listening to the businesses that are around it that are affected by it. If if the Old Town Association said, "Hey, this is bad for us," mm -hmm. and it was a business that was in it illegally, I would say let's sh let's shut it down. But the fact that their neighbors do not see this as a detriment to it is says that this is something we should be open to. I just want to I just want to speak up again on on the appointments. Um I, I just don't I don't think there's any way for us to really monitor whether or not people are making appointments. And even if they are, that's not going to ensure that there's not people lined up outside because they can schedule appointments for every 15 minutes. And it takes them an hour to do a tattoo on somebody or a piercing. And so, you know, it's it's kind of like going to get your hair cut when you when you maybe schedule an appointment and you check in, but you're still standing around waiting for the next haircut in front of you to be done. So I, I just don't think there's any way that we can control any of that or that that's going to that's going to assure that nobody's going to be standing outside waiting to get a tattoo. Um, Commissioner Foster and I, again, we have some people in public who'd like to testify, so I wonder if we might want to move to the public testimony and then continue our discussion based on what we hear. Um, persons in chambers who would like to speak on this item, would anyone like to come forward? Hi, Trish Heilman, um, uh, 139 South Fountain. Uh, I'm concerned about the protective overlays that were put into place. And I, and I want to sort of acknowledge and, and thank you for mentioning the questions of, but aren't we sort of doing, aren't we sort of letting people break the rules and then making it okay? And, and I think the neighborhood has said, hey, we're okay with this. And so I think getting to a, a solution is, is a great thing. However, I would love if there were some kind of teeth to breaking the rules as somebody who wants neighborhoods and residents to have some ownership and, and uh, accountability to what happens in their environment, where the person who made the lease with the tattoo parlor, they should have known that these overlays were in place and that they were giving a lease to a company that didn't have any right to be there. So along with maybe changing things so that the tattoo parlors are allowed and maybe you guys are incorporating some things about so many within a zone or whatever. I don't know. That's not my business. That's a neighborhood business. But is there any kind of way that we can put into this that says if a building owner who should be subject to this overlay um, breaks the overlay that there is some financial penalty. It doesn't have to be huge. We're not looking to put building owners under, but just something that says, know, know your property and do right by your neighbors per what their 
um, intentions were and are. So um, that's just my thoughts as a as a resident who really loves the ability of our city to do overlays so that residents get to have a say in what their environment is like. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Thank you. Next speaker, anyone in chambers who'd like to speak? Please proceed to the podium, your name and address, please, and you have three minutes. Hi, I'm Deborah Frazier. I'm the president of the Old Town Association and uh, from 121 North Mead in Old Town. Um, the appointment part is uh, intended to one, provide an enforcement tool of some sort. There's something that can in the future be used by officials um, as a president of the OTA. I plan to make the zoning overlay something that our businesses are aware of because they are not. It is just, we have, you wouldn't know you would believe all of the, the structure, the parameters that are on those businesses as far as what kind of sign they can have and how the lighting can be on the sign and the shape. And the we have so many rules in place. Uh, I think it is the association's responsibility at this point to make businesses aware. And I think that the delay on um, you know, that company uh, doing business there. It's my understanding they haven't really been able to do much business. They couldn't advertise. They couldn't put signage. Um, so they were, as I understand it, struggling. And I do believe that the, the delay in our getting to this point since last October, when the board originally said, had the, the vote to say it's okay with these parameters, that was back in October. And I don't think it's the business's fault that it took this long and I think that they're doing what the city told them they could do so I'm not saying sorry Scott but any questions okay so I guess I, any questions for Deborah Frazier I guess I would ask so the businesses in the vicinity in general don't have opposition or have agreed that this would be a good solution to allow the tattoo parlor as a new element of the overlay. Is that accurate? And it's been a conversation since last October. Um, and so far there, there's been no opposition to it. As we understand it came, came to be um, because nightclubs thought Old Town would be a great place to go uh, long, long ago. And when they stayed open really late, people did exactly as some suspected and went in groups uh, intoxicated and we get get tattoos at two or three in the morning thus the parameters to close at 10 so that they wouldn't be coordinating hours with any nightclubs and then the appointments again provide uh, for controlling sort of crowd control and some teeth for enforcement of however people enforce things yeah. it might be the association I don't know but um, it gives us something to look to okay Thank you. Commissioner Williams Bay. Yes. How many other tattoo parlors are in the area? I would venture to guess three, but they are literally, they are on the outskirts. Not in the old town overlay. No, no, they are a stone's throw away. Okay. Any other questions for the speaker? Commissioner Foster? Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else in chambers who'd like to speak on this topic? Is there anyone participating virtually who would like to speak on this topic? I would. Okay, can you give us your name and yes. address please? And you have three minutes. Yes, okay, my name is Brooke Russell and I am an owner of Pavement Properties in Old Town, as well as a co-owner of Public at the Brickyard in Old Town. And we are less than a block away from this tattoo pot parlor. Um, we have um, struggled in Old Town over the last few years with vacancies, especially since COVID. 
Um, this retail has really struggled in Old Town in general. Um, and this specific shop is not just a tattoo parlor, as you probably know, but there are there's a sneaker store um, in the building as well as um, a vape shop. So um, we are in support of the tattoo parlor. Um, we've had customers come through the restaurant um, that uh, are customers of the shop across the street and um, the owners come into the restaurant and purchase food. And that's what we need in Old Town. We need people supporting local business and that's what I'm seeing from them right now. I think Foster, um, I, I, I don't know if her name's Deborah Foster, but I think her point about tattoos is right on that uh, this is an archaic zoning um, issue. And I think that um, the culture has grown past it. And so I think um, from what I understand, there are no business owners in Old Town that are opposed to this tattoo shop or other tattoo shops. Um, the reason why we talked, um, I'm also on the Old Town Association board, and the reason why we talked about these, um, these uh, conditions was because we did want to like kind of curb the idea of late night tattoos um, in the district. Um, and if there is a long line, we want to be able to report it. But other than that, we see no issue. Um, and let me tell you, rent in the Old Town is not cheap. So I don't foresee a big, um, you know, I don't, I don't foresee a big rush of tattoo shops in Old Town. If people can afford the rent, then and the parking fees that we pay, then um, I guess they have a right to open a shop there. But a shop is better than a vacant building, which I have plenty of those around me too. Thank you for your testimony. Is there any questions for the speaker? Are there any additional persons participating virtually who would like to speak on this item? Uh, yes, my name is Matt Lashley, and my son Blake is one of the owners Matt, of the establishment. Could you, yes, could you give us your name, your full name, and your address, please, for the record? That'll allow us to keep you hooked into this discussion as it goes forward as well. Yes, sorry, my name is Matt Lashley. M A T T L A S H L E Y. My address is 511 Fawnwood Court, Wichita, Kansas, 67235. Thank you. Now you can proceed. Okay. Um, like I said, my name is Matt Lashley. My son, Blake, is one of the owners of the sneaker store in this area. Um, the, the, the answer to the questions about the lines and everything, um, there's never a line out there because the way that Ty does tattoos he averages about three tattoos a day. So there's, there's not lines outside of people rushing to get in there. Um, a ta an average tattoo takes about two hours. So, you know, there's, there's, there's not a rush of people just lollygagging outside and waiting around and causing problems. In fact, there hasn't been no calls out there, no concerns. Um, of any kind with law enforcement. Um, the neighbors are always welcoming and come over there. But if you go in, you have to kind of understand what this is. It's a store that's opened all the time. Um, the sneaker store is opened all the time. So um, the tattoo shop is just a little part inside of the sneaker store. Um, so, and then um, to, address one of the gentlemen that said that they were illegally operating, they were given permission to operate and tell the clarity of this. So once they found out and all that, the city gave them time and, and did not force it. So actually they weren't in violation of anything because they were given time to, for this hearing right here, if that, if that makes sense. So, you know, that was my part of it. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Yeah, I don't want to be argumentative. I think the question was when they first started operation, not when the city found out and gave them an extension. The city didn't proactively allow them to be in there initially. Yes, that is correct. 
Thank you. I will state one more thing. I'm sorry, but um, on the licensing that some gentleman addressed was they have been they have been completely licensed through Topeka. They come down, they check out the area, they make sure that the entries and exits and all that. So they are actually technically licensed from Topeka legally to do this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Williams Beta, do you have a question? Yes, is there is there only one uh, uh, tattoo artist in the shop? Uh, yes, sir, there's only one. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the speaker? Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone, anyone else participating virtually who would like to speak? Okay, let's bring it back to the table. Commissioner Foster. I know I brought up a couple of the questions that have been under discussion, um, but I think we need to remember we're not, the discussion is about this particular individual tattoo shop, but what we're talking about doing is amending an overlay district so it will affect all future potential tattoo shops in Old Town. Um, so I'm less interested in the specifics about this business and more interested about the general impact that this amendment would have on the future of Old Town. And having said that, I think I, I understand Commissioner Aldrich's point about not rewarding a business that's been in violation, but A, I'm not sure how you punish the landlord without punishing the business B, I don't think it's our role to punish. And C, I'm pretty sure we can't retroactively go back and change the rules to punish someone for something that isn't in our venue anyway. So having said all that, um, I think the amendment as presented is worth implementing. Um, if future problems to be develop there's we can amend the amendment you know we can continue to make additional changes if necessary i move that we approve this amendment as presented second i have a motion from commissioner foster and a second from commissioner green any additional discussion on the item ready to call for a vote um, I'm going to try to uh, call for in, all in favor. Please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Aye. Have one opposed. And uh, Commissioner Nix has left the meeting. So that would be motion passing uh, 10 1. Thank you. Commissioner. You're also an. an oh, I want a question. Okay. I don't want to vote for it. I don't want to vote against it. So you want to abstain from the vote? Is that loud? Sure. You can abstain. I'll abstain. Okay. So we have nine in favor, one opposed, and one abstention. He might have gone to get a tattoo. In fact, I'm going to go check out the parlor to add to my collection personally. But he was sitting here starting to tattoo himself. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, I'd like to make it just all over with now. I think what Ms. Foster brought up about changing times with the way we're doing things today. I happen to be around when we started doing the amendments in Old Town and the overlay and all that and everything else. And we've amended that so many times back and forth because of situations that's happened. And uh, I would hate like Fury to say you can only have so many in an area because if you do that, what would that do to Old Town if it started running into the restaurant business and the alcohol business and the stuff? Because, you know, when Old Town was started, we had to amend a whole lot of things. Parking regulations weren't, that's why they built the, the, the uh, parking garages and stuff in there because none of them conformed because of the past zoning of industrial where they didn't have to have all that stuff. So I think it's just one step forward. Well, and I, I want to punish the people who take action, you know, before we do anything because they're property owners and have a right to. Well, maybe it's time. Oh, where's the enforcement happen? It's really in our code division, correct? It, it is. And, it, you know, in short, the process is that if we receive a complaint, 
we will go out uh, and observe whether or not that's actually happening. If we verify that, then we provide notice uh, to the property owner about uh, the violation and we give them typically 30 days, 15 days, okay, depending 15 to 30 days to resolve that situation and, and keep in dialogue with us. Um, in this instance, as noted during uh, part of the situation with this is it's kind of complicated about we got input about allowing the business to operate and a desire for that and looking at the variety of different options that were available with the zoning code. And, and I think that's reflected in the conversation that we had at advanced plans, not the, not with this proposal, but with the prior proposal. So yeah, it's, it's been quite a dialogue. Well, maybe in today's culture, you might want to look at revising the uh, unified zoning code. Well, we are in many instances, correct, Scott, looking at some, changes we are um and that's been to a variety of things i don't i can't think of a time when we've had as many changes to the zoning code coming up and taking place or in consideration we have nightclubs we had daycares we've got this one in old town um, airbnbs short-term rentals is another one and um, each of them is complicated in their own way so but um what i neglected to say with the enforcement is so we, we give them a certain amount of time, specified amount of time to get corrected and get in, in right with the zoning code um, or to get in dialogue with us about how that's going to happen. Um, if either of those are unsuccessful, then we will continue to take it to court. Uh, and that is where the penalties are assigned. Okay, thanks for the clarification on that. Um, now we have a item, a non-public hearing item. Uh, Mary Hunt will present the Cedric County Capital Improvement Program or introduce it so that we can uh, understand what's coming up for our community. Okay. Well, Mary? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Hunt from the Planning Department. Uh, today we have uh, Sedgwick County uh, Public Works going to be presenting on the county CIP, which is a five-year program, and that begins in 2024 and goes out for five years. So with that, I'm going to ask Lynn Packer, uh, the Public Works Director and our county engineer, to come up and kick this off. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you, Mary. Planning Commissioners, good afternoon. Um, I'm here today uh, with Pat Paul Cavanaugh. He is the manager of our project services division uh, to talk about our 2024-2028 capital improvement program. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, currently we're about halfway through the budget and uh, CIP approval process. Uh, public hearings are will come up next, uh, followed by budget adoption, which includes the capital improvement program itself. Next slide. So why do we do this to you every year and just make your long meetings ever even longer? <laughs> it's not my idea. Uh, state statute 12748 uh, mandates that the Planning Commission make a determination that our CIP is in conformance with the current comprehensive plan uh, before we can construct any of the projects listed in the program. So um, hey, again, not my idea, but we go through it. Uh, and also, also, you know, it's just a nice way to, to know what's going on in the area and, what, and what's going on. Uh, next slide. So the cur current community investments plan was adopted by the Board of County Commissioners on January 16th, 2016. And I believe the city also approved it uh, around that same date, maybe the day before. Uh, the plan takes, sets out the goals and standards that are uh, the kind of guide our projects. And we're here today seeking a finding from the commission that our CIP is in conformance with this plan. So at this time, I'm gonna have Paul come up and uh, present the facilities and drainage projects. And then I'll come up afterwards and talk about the uh, public works projects. Thank you, Lynn. Paul Cavanaugh, project services manager for the county. Uh, I know it's been a long day. I'll try to be brief and roll through these as quickly as we can so you can take advantage of the good weather when, uh, when you get out of here. Uh, okay, they're categorized in four different levels of uh, priority. Cap uh, the first one is the highest priority, and if we can go to that slide, thank you very much. Uh, these are the ones that are of the highest priority. 
And you can see that they're mostly uh, preventive maintenance issues. The Wichita Valley Center flood control system, uh, maintenance and repairs, roofs and parking lots in the county, uh, repairs and replacements as they are needed, the outdoor warning devices for uh, tornadoes and emergencies are being replaced. Elevator upgrades in the main courthouse and the historic courthouse. And if I go too fast and you want to stop and get into the details of one, I'm happy to do that. Uh, EMS garage facility, we need a new uh, facility to house uh, the units, the six bay unit building. That will help them, uh, the EMS comply with state regs. One of the projects that we're excited about really is the juvenile community based services building. As you can see, it's a pretty good slug. The first year is going to be the design. The next is going to be construction. It houses the juvenile residential facility, juvenile field services, and house, housing home base services. Uh, the JFS is losing their facility, their lease down at the uh, old Harry Street Mall. So they decided to maybe consolidate all of these juvenile services into one area, one facility on the juvenile campus. So we're, we're excited about that. ADF domestic water heater replacement, that's the Cedric County Jail adult detention facility. And we've got six huge water heaters that are phased out to be replaced. The ages are 12 to 25 years old and they are worn out. Next slide, please. Very easily, uh, ADF dishwasher exhaust duct is worn out, has holes in it. Um, the historic courthouse data center needs an equipment refresh. Um, they're talking about air handler units that are have lived out their life, uninterruptible power sources, and uh, an upgraded power distribution system. And then uh, red brick east restroom at the uh, at the park, and also public work salt storage building at the East Yard. Simply, it's, a, it's an existing wood structure they want to replace with a uh, steel structure. Floating docks at Cedric County Park, they're wood, several of them, and they are beginning to be dangerous. So we're going to try to get those replaced. Next slide, category two, these are not ur as urgent or well-defined, but need to be looked at and funded in the short term. Uh, of course, the jail annex boiler, water heater, storage tank, uh, they're getting to their end of their life expectancy. Uh, the Munger building and historic courthouse boiler, the same thing. They're 22 year old steam, built, steam boilers. Most of the parts that they need to replace uh, are out of date. Uh, power factor correction at the adult detention facility, main courthouse and historic courthouse to try to make the energy use a little bit more efficient and hopefully cost a little bit less. Main courthouse perimeter security is essentially bollards across the front of it, across Main Street entrance uh, to keep people from being able to drive a vehicle into the lobby. Uh, EMS access control for the 18 facilities of the EMS, card activated doors, so they can enter each of the different facilities, common system. Uh, renovate the Cottonwood Shelter at Cedric County Park and replace the playground structure uh, at LAP. Next slide. Again, these are not as urgent as the first slides, uh, but need to be thought about and replaced soon. EMS post one. Uh, that's in a building that uh, was originally the Riverside Hospital, but now it's owned by Via Christi. And I think they're getting ready to sell the building or trying to sell the building. Uh, so when they do, that probably means we'll have to move. So we're thinking about another location for that EMS post. EMS also wants video surveillance for 17 posts. Uh, they have a handful of HVAC units at some of the posts that are uh, obsolete and need to be replaced. 
extension office facility upgrades that's been in use and well used for quite a while, uh, built in 93, upgrade finishes and uh, more efficient water, heating and lighting fixtures. Uh, project works, open face storage, and that's uh, times three. We're talking about three different uh, open face buildings for the protection of uh, public works building the equipment to keep it out of the weather. Weather, sorry. Uh, replace four Cedric County Park gazebos and um, create some more uh, campsite water hookups at Lake Afton. I think they only have 16 right now. We would increase that number to 58. Category three, these are projects that are out on the horizon, a little bit lower sense of urgency, dog park for Central County Park, the firing range out at uh, Lake Afton for the Sheriff's Department. The building out there is uh, experiencing some structural uh, damage and we're talking about boosting up that foundation. The EMS uh, at four posts, we would like to put in emergency generators that are natural gas driven, so they have a more uh, permanent source of power. Renovate the EMS administration building, that's in sore need of, of a renovation. A boundless place scape rubber base repla replacement at the park, say that three times. And then the uh, Judge Riddell Boys Ranch Space Development. Uh, we're talking about um, putting a disc golf course and some other activity things out there. Let's see, next slide would be category four. These are projects that are on the watch list. Uh, we need more information on a lot of them, but they are not as critical as the ones you've seen to this point. Uh, BAS replacement and ADF HVAC retrofit. That's a digital control system on all of the HVA systems, environmental controls in the ADF uh, to try to reduce the amount of energy that we're spending in that facility. Juvenile file storage conversion in uh, the main courthouse. Also stairwell door assembly updates for fire rating. Um, main courthouse, the district court is already in a pretty sizable remodeling effort uh, for the district courts. This would be phase two of that effort to upgrade courts and offices. Um, let's see, main courthouse exterior brick upgrade. Uh, appraiser suite reconfiguration that's in the Reagan building and also the EMS post four replacement. And after that, we've got project types and funding sources that are pretty uh, self-explanatory. Any questions that I can fall back to or revise, relook at? I'm trying to make this as entertaining as I possibly can, but you know how it is. Commissioner Aldrich, I got a quick question. Yeah. What do you, you got a backup plan in case the state decides they're gonna cap the taxes and stuff? Uh, yeah, that list of four goes out to like six or seven. <laughs> we run out of money, we run out of money. Yeah, we would have to revisit it. But, uh, Commissioner Green. I know we haven't seen the city's uh, CIP program yet, uh, but when it comes to uh, public safety, uh, say EMS, um, are there any efforts being made to coordinate the construction of say new police substations and or fire stations with county um, EMS and or county sheriffs? whenever there is that uh, something that is maybe a, a duplication of efforts. Understood, and, and in several instances, and we are beginning to look more at a combination EMS and fire department stations for that very reason, 
to try to not duplicate efforts or facilities. So that is something we're beginning to look at. As far as city, county, I, I'm not aware of anything there. That's yeah, I'm not idea. talking about a consolidation of, of, of those, yeah. but I, I think to be you know wise stewards of taxpayers' money, I think any efforts that could be made to uh, consolidate construction to um, combined efforts would Agreed. make a lot of sense. Agree very much. We'll have to uh, get that on the agenda a little bit higher up my pay scale. Any additional questions? Thank you. A lot of information Absolutely. presented very efficiently. Thank Great. you. You bet. Now let's hear about the other part of yes. CIP, Lynn. Next slide, please. On to the uh, Public Works Road and Bridge Infrastructure. Next slide. So just a quick background. Um, some of you already know this or have heard it, but we have 600 mi 609 miles of roads that we maintain in the county and 603 bridges. Uh, we maintain more bridge structures than any other ju jurisdiction in the state other than KDOT. Uh, and we now have 19 miles of multi-use paths in the unincorporated uh, county. And that's just in the unincorporated county. I think it speaks a lot to uh, how those paths have just uh, bloomed over the last decade or so. Um, and on average, Cedric County roads carry over 1.5 million vehicles per day, vehicle miles per day. Next slide. So as for our projects, uh, we have four major categories or purposes uh, for the public works projects to maintain, to enhance, to expand, and add quality of place. Next slide. So maintaining our roads and bridges makes the bulk of our projects. Uh, these are projects such as our uh, preventive maintenance or annual preventive maintenance projects and bridge replacements and rehabilitation projects that we just have every year uh, consistently. Next slide. Uh, enhancing the infrastructure includes widening bridges, adding center lanes, turn lanes, um, and making roadside improvements. Next, uh, our third category is expansion. Expansion includes reconstructing a road, uh, for example, a two lane to a four lane or a five lane highway. Um, it also includes other projects uh, like uh, constructing new roads or bridges where one doesn't currently, currently exist. Uh, an example of that that you guys would recognize would be the ARC 95 uh, project we talked about uh, for a number of years uh, to kickstart that. Uh, next slide. Under quality of place category, uh, we include projects such as a shared use paths uh, and improvements and additions to public parks or other public, other public spaces. Uh, next slide. So our, in public works, we have two main goals with our projects. Uh, the first is to uh, perform preventive maintenance about every six years on our roadways to maintain them. And number two is to replace or rehabilitate about 30,000 square feet of bridge deck each year. Uh, and this comes out to be about a 70 year lifespan for our, our bridges we estimate at. Next slide. Some of the highlights for 2024 that differ from the presentation I gave last year, uh, we've increased funding on several of our projects to keep up with labor and material costs. I think that's gonna be a consistent uh, theme throughout all these presentations on the CIP you'll hear. Uh, eliminate, we eliminated funding to replace the 63rd Street Bridge over the Ark River. You may remember about two years ago, we did emergency repairs on 63rd Street South between Hydraulic and K-15 over there, uh, north of Derby and, and east of Hayesville. Um, we're expecting the repairs that were done there. We were able to get a little bit more done than just the immediate repairs. So we think we gained about uh, 15 years of life, uh, additional life out of that bridge. So we have canceled the, re the rehab project that was gonna be uh, actually occurring next year. And uh, we've added about six new bridge projects and three new road projects to the CIP in the outer years. <clears throat> Next slide. As noted, uh, maintaining our roads and bridges makes up the bulk of our projects. Uh, we are spending about $59 million on these types of projects and the proposed CIP, uh, five year CIP total. Next slide. Uh, for bridges, 
We have uh, one rehab project uh, that we're constructing in 2025, and that's the Seneca Street Bridge over the floodway. Uh, the goal is to get at least 20 more years of life out of that bridge. Uh, that'll be another one that will be a pain to close uh, when it does come time. So my goal is 20 years, or at least by the time I retire, I'll let my <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let others take care of it. Uh, we've programmed 23 bridge replacements at a cost of over just uh, $18 million over the five years. Uh, so we have a total of about 24 bridge projects planned uh, throughout the county at a cost of just under $21 million. Next slide. So enhance, enhancement of the roads, we uh, road enhancement projects total almost $37 million in this five year CIP and includes projects such as the North Junction. Uh, you guys are all familiar with that. It's going on right now, the gold phase and it, it, the upcoming East Kellogg improvements as well. We also have two shoulder widening projects uh, and 11 road reconstruction projects. Next pro uh, slide. We continue to invest in the future expansion of the road system uh, with funding of the Northwest Expressway uh, and KDOT and the county plan to contribute $1 million each year of the CIP. Uh, the cities of Mays and Goddard have been contributing since the beginning um, and they've agreed to continue to, to reimburse the county $5,000 each year uh, for their contribution of that project. Next slide. For quality of place, the Maple Street bike path uh, project is the current project addressing quality of place. It's uh, This is a 1.55 million uh, project that uh, actually complements uh, two Wichita projects uh, to improve Maple, Maple Street in the next 10 years. The majority of the funds for this project will come through WAMPO um, with construction scheduled for 2025. And next slide. So in summary, uh, public works portion of the CIP totals about $124 million over the five-year period. We have $59 million for road maintenance, $21 million for bridge, $37 million supports enhancement of the infrastructure. That's about 30% of the budget. Uh, $5 million uh, we will contribute uh, to uh, locally supports expansion via the Northwest Expressway. And you'll notice there's a $10 million total noted for that project, um, but I noted uh, $5 million is local, $5 million is coming from KDOT. Um, and we have $1.6 million for quality of place, which is about 1% of our total budget overall. So on the next slide, um, as I mentioned before, we need to find that uh, we're requesting a finding that we're uh, in conformance with the community investments plan. Um, and there are two goals for transportation projects in that plan. The first goal is to preserve and maintain a safe, cost-effective and reliable transportation system that strategically uh, supports the economic growth, vitality and quality of life aspirations in our community. Next slide. We feel that uh, we've met that first goal. Uh, we have a CIP um, that will, uh, all, it's already considered, you know, we're maintaining roads that are already considered in good condition. We have $80 million total proposed to be spent on the existing roads and bridges over the five year period. And that represents about 65% of the total budget funds we've requested. Next slide. The second goal the transportation, uh, for transportation within the community investments plan is to improve and increase the movement of goods, people, and information with better connectivity and mobility options in our community. And the next slide. Uh, we feel that we've met that goal uh, to invest uh, with the investment in the Maple Street bike path project, uh, and as well as the long range planning of the Northwest Expressway. Uh, the proposed bike path will connect Paz and Goddard with Wichita, and the Northwest Expressway would create a new route simplify, simplifying connections between Eastern and Western Central County. And almost last slide, next please. So today, uh, based on the information that we presented here uh, and the backup that you guys have uh, been provided in advance of the meeting, we're requesting that the MABC make a determination that our CIP is in, in conformance with the current comprehensive plan. Next slide, if there's, I appreciate your time. Uh, Paul and I are willing to stand if you have any questions for either of us. Questions? Commissioner Green. 
how much of the of the uh, your portion of the CIP budget with roads and bridges uh, is made up of gas tax revenue? Uh, all of our, uh, I can't say all of it, but the majority um, of our projects come from that revenue. It is dedicated solely for uh, not that we have a portion that's dedicated for that. We also have a portion of a one cent sales tax that was approved many, many years ago uh, that um, is only used on road and bridge. And that's the, uh, makes up the majority of our CIP. I'm, I'm assuming that uh, the legislative effort of the county when they go to visit our state legislators, um, they are expressing concerns about that gas tax, especially with the push uh, of EV or electric vehicles that are using all of these roads and bridges um, and not supporting any of that with the purchase of their electric vehicles and not getting any gas tax revenue at all. I'm assuming the county yes. legislative uh, body is pushing that. We have a, a concerns on a couple of fronts. Number one, uh, EV vehicles that are not used on that are utilizing the services of the municipalities and the state uh, through use of the roads, but not paying for the gas, um, therefore not contributing that portion of the tax uh, for their improvement. Um, that's increasing every year. There are more and more EV vehicles out there. In addition, we also use local sales tax in our CIP um, and the reduction of having uh, groceries taken off of local sales tax is going to have a big hurt on us as well. Um, one of the big uh, pushes that has been studied several times, um, my wife was actually part of an initial study several years ago, um, is trying to replace the gas tax with a use tax. So you would be you, you would be charged based on your use of the roads. Um, and, I, and I say that just because I do believe that in order for this the reduction of these taxes is going to have to result in some type of additional fee or tax to supplement that loss. And yes, we are actively talking to legislators about that. Other questions or comments? Commissioner Johnson? No, Mike, as you can see up there, it's a good day to be a civil engineer and not so good to be an architect. <laughs> well, his yeah. The the previous report was good for you though. It looked like there's some business opportunities there. We're equal opportunity. <laughs> we're we're supporting both. <laughs> so, right. uh, Madam Chair, uh, I'd like to make a motion that uh, the proposed CIP is in conformance with the comprehensive second. plan. We have a motion from Commissioner Green, a second from Commissioner Joe Johnson. Any further discussion? If not, I'll call a vote. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Motion passes 11-0. Thank you for your time and attendance. There being no other meeting topics, we are now adjourned.